Hi, welcome back to another lecture. Today I'm going to be talking to you about mixed effects models. And I simply want to introduce these to you. A major point of Methods 2, the second course, will be dealing with mixed effects models. They're more complicated than your basic analysis of variance, but there's a reason for them to be more complicated. That's to account for those things that are difficult to address in a standard analysis of variance. You've already had a hint of that a little bit. We've dealt a little bit with um, blocks and also uh, repeated measures you'll see in the lab uh, in this week, where time is very conveniently treated as a random effect in a mixed effect model. It's much more clumsy to do it with a standard analysis of variance. So it's on the edge of going towards the second semester course, but it's useful for you to know that these exist and are far more efficiently handled in other models, uh, more modern approaches, mixed effects models approaches, than in a classic analysis of variance context. So I just want to introduce these to you. We're not going to belabor it too much. You'll dink with a little bit in the lab, and that'll be sufficient. Okay? So what am I going to get into? Well, there's fixed versus random effects, and I need to uh, help try to explain those as best as I can to you. It's actually been rather controversial. Some people say this is a red herring. We shouldn't be talking about these fixed versus random effects. Of course, uh, the terms exist and have existed for quite a while, and that means that they are actually relevant in how we do statistics. So de despite the debates about whether they're useful or not, we actually do have to wrestle with these terms. So I'll try to get there with you. Um, we also need to understand what is meant by random treatment. It's not always obvious. And trust me, there's um, been some struggles um, among a bunch of us in a big project on what we actually would consider random. So this is not an easy thing to do. And then one more way to try to help think about that might be thinking about random intercepts and random slopes. That's maybe useful to try to help understand the difference between fixed and random effects. It also helps segue a bit towards where we're going to be going the rest of the semester, which is regressions. So a fixed effect might be represented by this really lazy way to make a chain work. And then a random effect might be those really strange images you find if you see what's been going on with Google Street images. People have been collecting the goofy ones. Here's a couple guys who seem to have been sitting waiting for the Google Street uh, car to go by and then go chasing after it in their scuba suits. So um, there's all kinds of random things that just pop up and uh, some of them are pretty wacky. Okay, well, let's move on. Fixed versus random effects models. I'll try to see if I can contrast them here in a simple way, in a dichotomy. A fixed effect would be one where the treatment levels, low, medium, high, etc., are important. You want to know about the difference caused between low and medium treatments, or medium high, etc. Okay. On the other hand, a random effect might be one where you're not really worried about the different levels. There's different kinds of things that might happen at random, and you're not really interested in what the differences are between level A and B or something. Okay. They just happen to be there, and you need to account for those differences in your analysis because they contribute to the variation. And if you can say this chunk of the variation is due to the random effects, you're better able to see then the amount of the remaining variation that's due to your fixed effects. Okay, That's partly why we're trying to separate fixed effects and random effects in analysis so we can better delineate what the fixed effect might have been. Okay, Maybe another way to think about it. You've specifically chosen certain treatment levels for a fixed effect. You want to know what are the effects of low versus medium versus high levels of fertilizer on your tomato crop. right? Okay, well, if it's a random effect, you're saying, yeah, whatever. I don't really want to know how much of that was really going on. I just need to try to see, well, there was something different in the soils, and conveniently, I measured how much the soils differed, and so therefore, I can account for it, okay? Uh, maybe this way. You might say an expected gradient would be in a fixed effect. You set up a block design um, in the greenhouse, where the, the blocks closest to the window receive the most light, and the ones furthest from the window are getting less light, that's an expected gradient. In a random effect, you don't know what the pattern might be in advance. You're just hoping that some of the noise in your analysis is captured by you setting up some sort of a pattern, okay? And hopefully that works, all right? Hopefully that makes some sense there. Let's try another way to think about this. Um, 
maybe I'll try to come up with some examples of random treatments. Okay, There are treatments at times when you already know that you might want to try to address it and you can consider it a treatment like a block. Um, this is a random penguin uh, cartoon. There are some other random penguin ones which uh, I guess I shouldn't show you uh, given that they're somewhat scatological, etc. Okay, well let's see. Random treatments might be first contrasted as uh, opposed to a fixed effect. So I think I showed you this illustration once before. It's an example that we did where we set up a bunch of buckets out there in the woods and uh, the well in a field actually. And there's this tree line here. So we knew as the experiment went on through the year, eventually the leaves would drop off the tree line and the wind blowing primarily from the west to the east was going to throw more of the leaves in the close buckets and fewer of them farther away from the tree line. Okay, So we already expected this pattern to happen, so it's a fixed block. We knew to set up blocks one, two, three, four, further and further away from the tree line. Okay, That would be really different from a random effect. Now let's see, do we have an example of a random block design? I should say, not carefully, carefully here. A randomized block design means I randomized my treatments among the blocks. That's different from saying random blocks. Okay, So in fact, I do have an example of random blocks where we tried to set up a bunch of different sampling blocks across a big ranch. Not in any one direction, but just sort of to account for, well, more or less on the northwest corner, more or less in the southeast corner, because this ranch was a complicated layout, and it's a big area. We thought maybe spatial distances and pattern might matter a little bit. Here's what those, those ponds look like. This is ponds in a ranch we sampled. Each pond was part of a bigger experiment I won't bore you with. You've already played with some of the data in the lab. Um, but what we tried to, did, tried to do here was try to uh, include some of this pasture, the white pastures versus the gray pastures in each block. And we had sort of a pie wedge going on here where this would be one block, another block up here, another block down here, etc. Simply trying to account for whatever spatial pattern might happen across this ranch. And at the same time, we could say we're only going to sample certain chunks of the pie wedge in a given day because it takes you a while to get through all these places. Okay, So let's see. We have this gradient then that steps across where we expected it and we set up blocks to account specifically for that treatment. And we have another set of blocks where all we really did was try to set up some patchwork that we hoped might account for some of the spatial pattern. And in both cases it turned out to be good that we did that because it mattered a lot in our results. Okay, so those are spatial random treatments versus fixed, okay? Well let's see if there's a temporal way to think about this. You can have random effects through time as well as in space. If you were comparing two different samples, uh, two different sites, pools, where you're counting the abundance of bugs, you would be able to say there's a difference through time for each one of these pools, right? And that looks like they're a little bit different, although there's a little bit of synchrony here. There's not a whole lot of synchrony in other places. So we have a pool difference, right? The solid black squares are generally higher abundance than the open circles. But it looks like there's also a time effect that seems somewhat random where the numbers are bouncing around. That's very common in lots of field sampling and lots of repeated measures of kinds of analyses where you're sampling, sampling, sampling through time. Okay, The same sort of thing might be thought of as um, comparing uh, through time for any sort of other smaller scale uh, or individual uh, people kinds of studies. Here you get some baseline measurements then you inject a dose and you track for hours later. In the treated, you see a response, right? The, for example, blood chemistry uh, would step up because of the treatment, whereas you don't really see much of an effect in the controls. But, <coughs> excuse me, notice that there's a fair amount of variation, variation at the start, and only later do you start to see this effect sort of in the slope, I guess you would call that whereas the intercepts are something you need to account for early too. That, <coughs> that intercept difference is what we're talking about when we're trying to account for temporal or spatial autocorrelation. Okay? Now, I've already gotten to intercepts and slopes, so what are we trying to say with this? Random intercepts and slopes are a little tricky to understand, but maybe this will help. It's another way to think about what we're really trying to address when we're thinking about random effects. Random intercepts might best be thought of as different elevations, right? There's a y-intercept for the green that's up here, and the y-intercept for the blue and purple lines are much lower. 
So they have different intercepts between these, let's say, blocks or groups, uh, something that you want to try to account for that might not be the main point, but you're trying to figure out what's the effect of x on y, what's the slope. And notice that the slopes here are quite similar, not identical, but similar. But what's really different here is this big effect of blocks, okay? Or I shouldn't say blocks, of the random effects in general. So this random effect is causing some elevation differences in this treatment, uh, dose experiment, okay? Well, in another case, you might actually have different slopes. So what would that look like? If you had random slopes, it means that through any one cloud of points, you'd have a very different slope from another one, okay? Now, yes, they have different intercepts, but what's really different here, because they all cross at a center point here, is the slopes that vary the most, okay? And yes, as you might have guessed, you can have both. You can have both random intercepts and random slopes between treatments. Now remember, if we're considering data that look like this, this is just trying to account for these random effects. It might not even be addressing the fixed treatments that we're actually interested in. What we would be trying to do is account for an effect like this underneath the lying, underlying effects of, um, of a fixed treatment that we might have applied, a dose response, for example. Or your entire analysis might be handling these data as just simply random intercepts and slopes, and you might not have a fixed effect. So when we talk about mixed effect models, we're really talking about a variety of possibilities of fixed, fixed plus random, or just random effects models, okay? Now, mixed typically includes both, when that's the advantage of a mixed effect model. We're talking about things like uh, the package LME4 in R, or another one is GLMMADMB, on and on. There's a bunch of them. NLME. All these things are dealing with linear mixed effects in some way or another, okay? And they make it much more possible, much more flexible for you to deal with those mixed effects than you would in a classic AOV kind of approach. You can in analyses of variance, but it's much more awkward, okay? This is why I'm not even going to try to show you some examples right here. You'll play with one in the lab, you'll see how it works, and that'll be sufficient. Okay, so what are the bottom lines here? The other effects that you're trying to address in a study, the, the variation you need to try to account for to better reveal a fixed effect, etc., can be really efficiently handled with a mixed effect model. All of this is going to require that you think really carefully about your study design and analysis. If you know in advance what treatments to apply, and you've already thought about what might be these blocks or time effects in repeated samplings. You can really nicely design in advance your analyses, and it's all pretty much lockstep thereafter to be able to say, well, I knew this was going to be a random effect, or nope, this is a fixed block effect, etc. Okay? So think really well about your study design and the analysis before you do a study, and things are going to be much easier for you. You can handle a lot of data that are repeated measures type studies, which are very common in biology, uh, by treating time as a random effect. It's very efficient, and these linear mixed effect models, etc., are really good at handling it that way. It's the way to go. You can also think about blocks, spatial blocks, as random effects if they're not trying to account for a prescribed predicted gradient where you know exactly what should happen. Think about that tree line and the leaves blowing away from the trees as a fixed one, whereas any which way just we can sample over here today, we'll have to go to the place tomorrow, would be a random block, okay? Finally, there are these realized treatment levels that you get if you're trying to make a, an experiment and what you end up using in the subsequent analyses might not be the planned effect, like let's say low, medium, high fertilizer, but maybe you say, well, I dosed with what I thought were low, medium, high, but because of soils and all kinds of other things, I don't know, um, a deer came along and pooped in your experiment. I don't know. You get all kinds of weird effects that happen in field studies. You're going to end up with wacky nutrient levels different from what you thought you were going to have low, medium, high. And maybe in that case, you have to treat those as a random effect because it wasn't really matching your prescribed levels. It was some sort of realized treatment levels. And you could handle those as a random effect then. Okay. So I hope I've convinced you that mixed effect models are really going to be an important part of your research, 
If you're doing a complicated analysis that has a bunch of things you can't entirely account for, like time or space or other sort of random effects that might happen in your experiments, okay? So think about whether or not you're going to need to learn about mixed effects models. My bet is that you will, and my bet is that you'll probably want to be getting into that in greater detail when you get around to the second course, okay? That's enough for now. I just wanted to introduce these to you, wave them at you, and make you see where this could go. Next, we're going to move on to some regressions for much of the last part of the semester, including model selection approaches, which are going to be very useful for you, I think. And uh, we'll be doing some other things, for example, some categorical analyses like chi-squared and stuff in the next lecture. Okay, that's it. Bye for now.